All right, this morning I would like to um, pray and uh, commit our time to the Lord because we are starting a new series of messages. Um, and uh, it's great that you're here this morning. Have you know that it's always good to be a part of things early on in the piece rather than come into it late? So let's pray and let's trust God that he will speak to us uh, again this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that you've brought us together, uh, Lord, to, to worship you and to praise you, and Lord, to uh, be reminded of things that we already know, but also to learn new things. And so, Father, we commit to you uh, the teaching and the preaching of the Word, and I thank you, Lord God, that you're helping me, Lord, to proclaim the Word clearly and accurately, and you're helping us all to receive the Word and to lay a hold of it. I want to thank you, Father, for a fresh revelation in each and every one of our hearts, and we thank you, Father. Father, that, Lord, through this series of messages, as we committed to you, Lord, that we're going farther uh, and uh, we're going faster than what we've ever done before. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you haven't got an outline in your hand, uh, please raise up your hand and wave your, your hand around and somebody's going to get you an outline. Um, as I said uh, just before, we are starting a new series of messages um, beginning today, uh, ending in the few weeks' time. Uh, I'm not entirely clear how many messages will be in this series, uh, but we want to keep going until we've got a good handle uh, on the subject that we are discussing um, starting today. The title of uh, this message and this series of messages is How to Develop Strong and Overcoming Faith. How to Develop Strong and Overcoming Faith. And uh, many of you have heard teaching on faith before, uh, but some of you have not. Uh, in terms of everything we preach, uh, we would like to believe that faith is woven throughout it. Uh, we are, after all, word of faith people, so faith is in everything that we say and do. But every now and then it's good to stop and to just entirely focus on faith, uh, what it looks like, what it is, how to get it, how to release it. And as I said, uh, some of you have not had any such teaching before, so I'd really encourage you to pay full attention because this teaching is going to help you. Some of you have heard teaching before. Uh, I ask you to not tune out and say, I've heard this before, uh, because you see, we need to understand that the Word of God is always fresh and always new. And uh, revelation is not just having it or not having it. There are layers of revelation. It's a bit like peeling an onion. Uh, you peel it a layer at a time, and you peel and you peel. Uh, and so it is with revelation on any uh, area um, that the Word of God speaks about. And so for me, every time when I restudy the subject of faith and each time when I reteach it, I get a fresh revelation and it really helps me. Uh, and so people think, oh, the pastor wants to help us with teaching on faith. Well, the pastor wants to help himself with teaching on faith because each time I re-look re at it, it's like, wow, you know, like it's just really good to be reminded of things and to have a fresh understanding of this area. So it's a little bit like building a house house. I want to start from ground zero. We're going to start with a blank, uh, with a blank page, as it were. We're going to start with a blank, uh, you know, a, 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 an, a, an empty piece of ground. I want to start from the ground up. Um, and uh, and uh, if there are any uh, foundational aspects uh, that perhaps we have not looked at before, then hopefully we will pick that up this time around. Um, I usually talk to uh, the saints in regards to, you know, doing some of the courses that we run to fill any gaps. And uh, I find that many Christians have got gaps in their understanding. And we want to close the gaps and we want to make sure that the foundation has all the corners that it needs, that it's got all the... All all the, 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 the foundation, all the piles, everything is in place, that it's got the walls, that it's got the roof on, and that inside everything is functioning and everything is humming. And so since, since we have prayed already, I want to read the opening scripture here from Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, and here in verse 1, uh, in verse 2, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses in the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. All right. The Bible speaks here about that the Christian life is like 
a, a running a race, but it's not a quick sprint. It is an endurance race. How many of you have already found that out? It's not like, you know, like a 100-meter sprint. It's like, it's like a marathon that carries on and on. And so we need to know how to keep on running in this race. The Bible speaks here about a life of faith that God has called you and I to. Uh, verse 2 goes on to say, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. So here we're starting out in Hebrews chapter 12. Chapter 11 uh, has just gone through, and we haven't read it, but it is there. Chapter 11 is there. Uh, it speaks about the heroes of faith. Um, and uh, it starts way back. It talks about Abraham. It speaks of Isaac and of Jacob. And it speaks of David and of the various heroes of faith. And now it tells us that we are, the Christians, we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses that are like looking on. It's a little bit like in the Olympic Games when there is a, an event going on in the stadium that there's a huge crowd of witnesses, uh, of spectators. Uh, but the, 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 the people that, uh, that are watching, us, the heroes of faith, are not like the spectators that have never been in the game, but the heroes of faith have been in the game before, uh, and they know what it's like in order to keep on running this race, and they're cheering us on, as it were. Um, and uh, so once again, I want to pick up on the fact that, uh, that uh, it speaks, this passage of Scripture here speaks about living a life of faith. And the first point that I would like to make is this, that living the life of faith begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, without him and apart from him, we cannot live a life of faith. It is not possible. Uh, because here it speaks about the fact that he, that he is the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So I say it again, strong faith... And that's what we're discussing here today. Uh, even though faith comes by hearing, but strong faith begins with a personal, close relationship with Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that he is the initiator and he is the perfecter of our faith. Um, and so I guess that's the first point. Uh, point number one, and I want to make six, seven points here today to lay the foundation, uh, if you like, so that hopefully we've got a good comprehensive understanding as we're going forward in this series of messages that we can build on this foundation. And by the time we get to the end of it, at least we know what strong faith looks like. We know how to get it and we know how to operate in it. I don't know about you, but when I get a new gadget, I want to learn how this thing functions. I'm somehow not satisfied with, with just operating a new gadget on 20% of its capacity. Uh, and, you know, it's a little bit like the Christian life. If we only, uh, you know, like if it were an eight-cylinder car, if it only hums along on three, four uh, cylinders, it's just not right. Uh, we need to just max this thing out and go all the way out. As we heard this morning, as, as Benita shared in the Thai talk, it's just all in. Uh, how many of you want to be all in? Uh, give me a show hand. You want to be all in, then. Let's go all in in this life of faith. And uh, so, again, uh, he's the initiator and he's the perfecter of our faith. Uh, the word here, initiator, means that he's the author and he's the architect of our faith. You know, an architect is the one that sits down and designs something and then puts it down and then, and then helps to get it built. And so Jesus has... has uh, uh, is the architect of our faith. He is the, uh, the, the author of it. He's also the developer of it. And a close relationship with Jesus along the way is absolutely necessary because if we somehow uh, get a little disconnected from him, then in our faith will no longer get developed. And the Bible says he is the finisher of it. He is the perfecter of our faith. You know, when they build a house... Uh, 
As I said, they start with a, a, a blank piece of ground and then they lay it all out and they call it setting out. And for those of you that are builders, you turn up at the building site and you start setting out and then you work out where your corners are going to be and your foundations and, 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 and so forth. And then you build the house and then when it's pretty much finished, then, uh, you know, with the house with the roof on it and you got cladding on the outside and you got, what do you call it, the, uh, the, all the walls on the inside, everything is done. Now you doing the finishing work. You're going around, you're putting on the door handles and you, you're putting on the hardware on, on this and on that and then, you know, the life fittings, everything goes in and then, and then the powers turn on and you got a, a house that you can live in. Faith is a bit like that. Uh, it starts somewhere and it is developed and, and then it gets to a stage where it's functioning and you turn the light on and it's working and, you know, you, you turn the tap on and water comes out uh, as it were rather than just, why isn't half the stuff working here? Where the builders, you know, like they didn't finish this thing properly, uh, but the reality is that, you know, in terms of developing our faith, it really comes back to us ourselves. Uh, um, I want to talk about that just a little bit more uh, in just a moment. So point number two, and it's in your outline, that everyone who receives Jesus as Lord is given a measure of of faith. And I don't know about you, but that encourages me. Uh, and I, when I first read this and when that was first pointed out uh, in all the teaching that I have heard uh, uh, over the years, I was really encouraged uh, because sometimes we might get into situations like, you know, is my faith really, you know, what it should be and, and so forth? Well, the Bible says that uh, we have all been given the measure of faith. Here it is, Romans chapter 12 and in verse 3, it says, for by the grace given to me, says Paul the Apostle speaking, says, I say to every one of you not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think with sober discernment as God has distributed to each of you a measure of faith. God has distributed or given to each of you a measure of of faith. One translation says the measure of faith. Whether it's a or the, it doesn't matter. The reality is that every born again believer has been given the measure of faith. All right? And, uh, when it says to each of you, Paul the Apostle is speaking to the Christians. He's speaking to the believers. It's only Christians that have the measure of faith. And we were given that at the point of being born again. Um, and uh, good for us to realize and to understand that there is no superior measure and no inferior measure of faith. God's given to every single one of us the genuine article, the measure of of faith. Um, and uh, to move on to point number three, and I did say that I was starting from ground zero uh, to make sure that we kind of lay a proper foundation. Point number three, it is now our responsibility to develop and grow that measure of faith that we have been given. All right. So it's now we need to take responsibility for this measure. If I wanted you to grow some, some uh, vegetables or grow a tree or something so that you get your own fruit and everything. Uh, once, once I give you the seed, if that was the arrangement, once you got the seed, it is then your responsibility to plant the seed and to make this thing grow and to nurture it and to look after it. And so it is with faith. God's given us faith in seed form. There is a measure there. All right. And uh, now God says, okay, you, you get this measure developed now. And, and you make sure that, that, that you learn how it works. And, and you make sure that, that you know how faith is released. And, and, and uh, that you get this deal functioning and that you get it working properly. I'm going to read to you from Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Um, it says, We must always thank God for you, brothers and sisters. This is again Paul the Apostle. In this instance, he's speaking to the Thessalonian believers, uh, to the church in Thessalonica. He says, We thank God for you. Uh, he says, This is only right because your faith is growing more and more. I don't know about you, but I like that. Uh, that. That statement right there, your faith is growing more 
and more. All right? Uh, it says, and the love that every one of you has for each other is increasing. So it speaks about faith growing and love increasing. And that really is the point here in terms of uh, the, the measure that we have been given. Um, it's, it's, it's not an inferior measure. Uh, and one wasn't given a smaller measure than another one. In fact, the measure that we have been given fits with the calling and with the purposes that God has placed on our lives. And there are special callings along with that come, if you like, a sort of a special measure. But beyond that, everybody uh, has to develop the measure that they have been given. And it says here that, he says that your faith is growing more and more. And I'm encouraged by that. It means I'm not just stuck with the measure that I've been given, but I can actually make this thing grow more and more. Um, one day, uh, Jesus' disciples came to him and they said, Lord, increase our faith. I mean, they realized that things weren't quite as humming as what they wanted things to hum. And they looked at Jesus and they saw his faith really humming. And so they said, Lord, increase our faith. Um, and you know, the reality is that uh, somebody cannot increase our faith per se. We need to increase our own faith. Now, if somebody comes and shares truth with us and teaches us things that we do not know, they will cause our faith to increase for sure. But in the end, everybody has to take responsibility for their own measure of faith. And the good thing is, friend, as I said before, that we're not just stuck with the measure that we've got. We can make it grow. We can make it grow. We can make it increase. And see, faith is like a physical muscle, and a physical muscle is able to develop and to grow, to handle, say, if we were weightlifting, to handle bigger weights. And in the same way, our faith is like a spiritual muscle that is able to grow to help us handle bigger assignments and to handle bigger challenges in life and to handle bigger faith projects. And uh, friends, sometimes, sometimes in our journey of faith, it's good to not just say, well, I'm just going to use my faith until my needs are met. We don't want to just focus on needs. Sometimes we just stretch our faith for no other reason than to have a faith project. Not because we need something necessarily, but we want to exercise our faith and make it grow bigger. And uh, sometimes people don't even think about their faith because they think that faith is only made for the bad days. And they say, well, we got the good days now, so we don't need to be thinking about faith. But friends, the point is this, that we build our faith in the good days. So when the challenging days come, our faith is working. And so I encourage you to have, a, have faith projects on the go all the time. Because it's a little bit like, what is the point for somebody to go to a gym and to lift up them weights? And what is the point? I mean, there's not even any, you're not getting paid for this. So why, you're not even enjoying it. Uh, wh why are you doing this? It's a, well, I'm just exercising. Uh, my muscles are increasing. So when you get out there in the real world uh, and just general fitness and an ability to lift things and an ability to, uh, to uh, and it's not just about looks, you know, sometimes people just want to increase their muscles, muscles because it looks better and, you know, each to their own, but, but just exercise and, and faith needs to be exercised um, and we will get into that plenty uh, in future messages when that comes up. So faith, can I encourage you with this thought? Faith is like a spiritual muscle that can increase and grow. And so, wherever your faith is at today, it is what it is today. But it can be stronger tomorrow. It can be stronger next week. And at the same time, if you neglect your faith, it can be weaker next week and more weaker still the following week. I've sometimes shared this before, but I remember when my mother uh, was still alive, and she would talk about war days, and she was right in the middle of all of that as a young woman, uh, Second World War, and, 
along the way, she had looked after various people that had been injured in the war. And, uh, you know, they talk about the, they used a word, you know, and the invalids, uh, people that were somehow injured and, and couldn't use their limbs properly or were laid out. And, and she said, it is amazing, she says, how quick it goes when somebody doesn't use their muscles, how their muscles can shrink and sort of uh, kind of, uh, f- uh, I don't know the correct word. But you see, the medical profession understand that today. Uh, it's amazing when somebody can go through a major surgery, such as a, you know, a hip or a knee replacement, and one, once that's done, the very next day, they got them up on their feet because now it's developing the muscles again and making sure that the muscles don't sort of, as it were, slide away. And so it is, friends, with, with our faith. It's like developing our faith and making sure we are pumping and we are firing uh, on all cylinders, as it were. So let me really, really, really encourage you with that. Um, Focus on your faith. And let us not compare our faith with each other's faith. Let us only compare our faith with the potential of what's possible and seek to stretch further and to go beyond where we've been in the past. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15. Paul says, Nor do we boast and claim credit for the work someone else has done. Instead, we hope that your faith will grow so that the boundaries of your work among you will be extended. Again, Paul the Apostle is still speaking. He's still talking about faith growing. He's now speaking to the Corinthian believers. Before he talked about the Thessalonian believers. Now he's speaking to the Corinthians. And he says, look, he says, we really hope that your faith will grow. Uh, He says, so that the boundaries of our work among you will be extended. Friend, here's what happens. Um, Many people's world is very small indeed. Boundaries have closed in on them uh, all around. When we begin to focus, when we get born again and we receive that measure of faith, we begin to develop it. Our boundaries are increasing. We're pushing our boundaries. Suddenly, things are possible that were impossible before. Suddenly, we can do things that we couldn't do uh, you know, before. And uh, Paul's speaking here about the boundaries of God's work being extended out. You see, friend, when we develop faith in terms of our calling and our ministry, we are able to increase and we're able to do more than what we've done before. Sometimes, you know, particularly in the early days of people's Christianity, they are really, people are really quite busy with themselves and, 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 and that's fine, you know, I guess until people find their feet and suddenly they say, well, actually, there is life outside of myself. There's other people, and they got needs as well. So I, uh, God's called me to help and to, to, to teach other people and to serve other people and so forth. And so our faith, as it increases, it extends our borders. Uh, the kingdom of God grows. That is so for us individually because every single one of us has a ministry uh, outside the house, as it were. You know, we serve in the house and we, we have a ministry collectively that we fulfill and certain mandates and, and with everything that we got going on uh, in terms of mission projects and both local as well as, you know, overseas and so forth. This is all our faith working. You know, the fact that we're able to look after, and I've said this several times now, that we're able to look after 35 residents in a, in a very poor and impoverished country, uh, take care of all of their needs. We are doing that collectively as a local church, and we have extended our borders, and we are helping these people. And we're not just going to stop there, but we see if we can push the boundaries out a bit further still and see if we can increase the kingdom of God in that particular setting. And we do that collectively and I'd encourage you to do that individually as well, that you as an individual believer push beyond where you are right now. Faith is not just all about getting things, uh, but, but it, it is about getting things, but it's not all about that. Faith is about doing things, and faith is about serving, and faith is about, is about living and modeling a lifestyle of faith that other people can be inspired by. And as you're reaching out to family and friends and workmates, as your faith grows, roles, uh, the boundaries are going to get pushed out and the kingdom of God increases. 
I've got a few things written down here. You know, the sphere of our influence is widened. Uh, all right, so our influence grows. Uh, have you know that, especially these days, where the, with the complexities of just general living and the challenges that people are facing at every turn with, you know, with work, with, with health, with family and issues and everything. But when somebody's life suddenly begins to take shape and, and suddenly there is, a, there is a life of joy, there and there's a life of stability there. By the way, faith will minister stability to you. It'll absolutely do that. From an unstable life to a stable life, from a, from a kind of a, a, a scattered sort of a situation to something quite solid, you're going to stand out above the people around you. You absolutely will. Because that's what God intends. When we start walking by faith, things will start to get better. Now, that's not to say it'll solve all of our, you know, our potential attacks and onslaughts that come. And, but we learn how to handle those. We, we learn how to go through those and come out the other side. And rather than walking around the same mountain again and again and again, as people did in the wilderness for 40 years, we know how to get through the wilderness and we come out the other side and we don't let the devil push us back into the wilderness again. So I don't know where you're at today, my friend, but there is a better life waiting for you. There's a better life waiting for each and every one of us, a more effective life, a more purposeful life. Ha, I'll tell you what, I feel like preaching now. Woo. Restrictions in our lives are diminished when we start walking by faith. Restrictions in every way. I was mindful that uh, the blind man that Jesus healed, the beggar that was blind, and uh, quite a story really um, when Jesus made you know, some mud packs out of mud and, and out of dust and saliva and packed it on this guy's uh, eyes. And then he said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the very fact that the man didn't just say, oh, look, let me just scrape it off here now and it'll be all right. When, he, when Jesus instructed him to go down to the pool of Siloam, that was that man's faith working. And we're going to get into that. But faith works. Faith does things. Faith is not passive sitting there waiting. Faith does things. And this man's faith is working. And he washed and the Bible says he came seeing. Uh, when they questioned him, and uh, you know, the, the, the priest, they didn't like it. Uh, and when they questioned him, and it went to and fro, and they questioned him and questioned his parents and so forth, because they didn't believe that this man really got healed, but the reality was he... Uh, he did get healed. And, and these people accused Jesus of being a sinner. And, and, and he says, well, no, he's a prophet. And when they re-questioned him again, uh, you know, they threatened people to just throw them out the synagogue, him and his parents. And so his parents, like, you know, they were like, oh, let's not get into trouble here. They said, look, he's of age. Ask him. And in the end, he said, look, he says, I don't know a lot of these things. But he says, one thing I do know. Once I was blind, now I can see. And so when we walk by faith, it moves us from one into the other. It moves us from restrictions to a life of without restrictions. It moves us from a life of sickness and disease to a life of strength and of health. It moves us from a life of not being able to, you know, to fi operate financially properly to a life of divine prosperity where we know how to lay a hold of God's provision for our lives. And many of you, many of you, and I'm always encouraged when we hear these tight talks, and many of you can testify when you started to engage your faith, things got better. That's not to say that you can't have some challenges along the way. And that's not to say that suddenly, you know, the pressure can come on somewhere. But we learn how to deal with pressure. And, and we were able to put pressure back on pressure. You know, sometimes it's like putting, when pressure comes in and closes in on us, we put pressure on outwards because the devil wants to close you in. He wants to shut you down. He wants to diminish you. He wants to put the lid on you um, and, and keep you down and, and, and keep you quiet. But when faith comes, it lifts the lid and it stretches out the boundaries and it takes us to a life of beyond 
meaninglessness gives way to a life of purpose and a life of joy. <laughs> you know, when you can be joyful without the help of artificial help, as in, you know, various uh, substances and everything, when you can be joyful, that's really quite a testimony these days because a lot of people need a lot of help, <laughs> various substances in order to help them to be happy. But when the happiness on the inside rises up and the joy unspeakable and full of glory that the Bible talks about, then, friend, you're standing up above the rest of other people around you because the reality is we don't see a great deal of joy around us today that is not artificially induced. You know, there's numerous times when Jesus said to people, your faith has made you well. Or your faith has saved you. Go and as you have believed, let it be done to you. And that's what faith does. Faith saves us. Faith makes us well if we learn how to operate in it. And faith lifts us out of where we were before. And faith causes us to stand up to become a stable person, a stable believer, brings stability into your family if faith is truly employed and brings stability into your setting and it lifts us into the abundant life that Jesus Christ has spoken about in John chapter 10 verse 10 where he says that the thief which is reference to the devil he does not come except to steal, to kill and to destroy and then Jesus says but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And faith will lift us into that abundant life. I encourage you, don't settle for restrictions in your life. Don't settle for, with, with 50% liberty and 50% restrictions. You know, we can all appreciate, you know, certain graphs and images that we see, whether that's, you know, the battery uh, image on our smartphone, on, on our phone, you know, it means if it's 40% filled, it means it's 60% empty. That's what that means. And this, I'm not trying to turn this into a math lesson because if I did, many of you could do a better job than me. Uh, but, you know, if it's 80% filled, it means it's still 80% empty. And if you can, 20% uh, empty, there you go. I'm just, this is what I mean, you see. And uh, so if you can imagine a slider here, and, and we got this thing of, uh, of, uh, of liberty over here and restrictions over there, then we want the liberty to reach all the way across and to push out the restrictions. Let us not settle for 60% liberty and 40% uh, restrictions. Let's not settle for that. Because Jesus paid for 100% liberty, and your faith will get you there. Your faith will lift you there. And your faith will put pressure on the pressure that you're experiencing. Pressure of poverty. Pressure of sickness and disease trying to close in. Friend, when we learn on how to employ the God's economy in our lives and we begin to honor God uh, with our tithe and with our offering and we begin to, uh, begin to operate by faith, we, we no longer uh, need to wait for somebody to pay our bills and for government to look after us. God looks after us. We are able to earn our keep, and not only that, we are able to help other people around us until they get to the stage and to the place where they're able to do that for themselves because Jesus has intended for every single person to live the abundant life. 100% has been paid for. Friends, do not settle for any less. Don't say, well, I'm managing, I'm getting by. It's not about getting by. Jesus hasn't bought a life of getting by. He's bought an abundant life for us. <laughs> all of these people who I'm managing abundant life nothing else will do <laughs> I'm happy by the way <laughs> I just feel quite strongly about some of these things and each time when I look at this I say wow you know the potential is there for 100% let's not put up with 5, 10 or 15% uh, restrictions and bondages in our lives because we are enjoying, you know, already 75, 80% of liberty. Let's push this whole thing out of the way. Put pressure on the pressure. Put faith pressure to push things out of your life. 
Number four, the Bible speaks about varying levels or degrees of faith from no faith to strong faith. And as we study the word, there is, uh, you know, we could easily, easily reach a dozen or so points. I've written a few of them down uh, of where, where the Bible describes faith. And it starts out, if you like, uh, on, on our slider, where there's no faith there in people's lives. And we've just said before, when a person gets born again, they will receive the measure of faith. So they've got some faith now. Um, Jesus one day was out with his disciples on a boat uh, on the lake of, uh, on, the, on the lake of, um, whatever that lake was called, it's a Gennesaret or whatever it was called. And, uh, and the Bible says he was lying down and he was sleeping because he was resting because he had just done some ministry. He's about to do some more ministry. He's resting up a little bit. His disciples are operating the boat and, you know, they're putting up the sails and everything. And a, storm's co- a storm comes up and next minute, you know, they're taking in water and things are just not that good all around. And they walk Jesus and, and they said, Master, Master, don't you care that we are perishing? And because Jesus looked up and because he saw the storm and uh, he walked to the front of the uh, ship and a boat there and he began to speak to the storm and he says, peace, be still. And here's a point right there and we're going to get into details with that. But faith speaks and faith knows how to declare certain things. The Bible says the righteous shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto them. As part of our faith journey, we don't just ask from God. Certain things we ask from God, but many things we deal with because we have already been given the authority and we can decree and we can speak into situations and into circumstances and see a change. And the Bible says suddenly there was a great calm and then Jesus turned around and he said to them, how is it that you have no faith? How did he know that they had no faith? Because they spoke of perishing. And he, he was set to go to the other side to carry on ministry. I mean, he, he was already over there, but this guy, oh, we are perishing. All oh, things are going down. Things are so bad. Things are so bad. He says, how is it that you have no faith? You can soon tell if somebody's got faith or no faith when you get around them. And what they talk about will reveal whether there's faith there or not. And if there's faith, how much is there? And what level of development is it at? And it's not about putting anybody down, my friend, but we are saying, we are saying the people of faith speak end result. They speak victory. They, they, they do not speak defeat. They do not speak poverty. They do not, uh, you know, as I say, that's an aspect of learning faith and how it operates. We need to learn the language of faith. And the language of faith in this instance for Jesus was to command the winds and the storm. And he says, peace, be still. While these guys spoke of perishing, they'd already accepted what was going on. And they'd already seen themselves as the victims of, uh, oh, a storm is coming and we're all drowning. We're all perishing. He says, how is it that you have no faith? And the Bible speaks about dead faith. Dead faith in the book of James, uh, it tells us there, and we're going to get into some of that in more detail. I'm just listing uh, some of those uh, uh, descriptions of varying levels of faith. Uh, speaks about dead faith. The Bible says faith without works or faith without a corresponding action is dead. It's like a body without a spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. That's why I said before that the man that was blind, when Jesus packed the eyes on, it wasn't all Jesus' faith, it was his own faith that he did exactly as God told him to do. Go down to the pool of Siloam and his walking was a faith action and the Bible says he came back seeing. So faith speaks and faith acts. But dead faith is just faith that doesn't do anything. It just sits there. Um, Yet it's not hard to resurrect the dead faith and get it functioning into a life into a functioning faith. Then the Bible speaks about little faith. <laughs> one other time, Jesus is again with his disciples and uh, they're going from one place to another and they get there and they're out in the wilderness and there is no, there is no food out there. And, uh, and uh, then Jesus talked to them about the, the, um, 
the, the yeast uh, or the leaven of the Pharisees, which is reference to the teaching uh, that they brought. And he, they, you know, sometimes he's toggling in and out of uh, talking about spiritual things and then natural things, and they just couldn't get with it. And then they said, well, why is he talking about yeast? Maybe it's because we didn't bring any bread. And suddenly they realized we're out in the wilderness and we got no bread. And are we going to be hungry? And, and again, they're talking needs and they're talking problems and, and they're confused about things. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. So they had little faith. They had faith. You know, have you know that little faith is better than no faith? Yeah. All right. But little faith must not stay little. It can grow. And it did grow. I mean, some of these guys, they turned into spiritual giants. So they floundered along the way a little bit. And so, friend, uh, somewhere, somehow, we might flounder a little bit, but don't get discouraged. Yeah. Bible says, don't despise the day of small beginnings. I look back now, some of the faith projects that Pastor Vanessa and I started and everything, some of it might seem a bit puny today. But, you know, we learned and we heard that Dr. Uh, uh, Yongi Cho or David Cho was the pastor of the largest church in Seoul, Korea. Uh, when he was a young evangelist, he believed God for some socks, a pair of socks just so he could go out and preach and look right. And then he wanted to get around the villages where he was, so he believed God for a bicycle. And by faith, he received his socks and he received his bicycles. And I thought, well, if God will supply socks to him, why don't I use my faith to, to believe, uh, you know, uh, for God for some socks? And that was at a time when, when money was just a little scarce. Um, you know, when you got four kids and, and you're the only one earning money and, you know, you just bought a house and you're just, you know, paying the mortgage. Sometimes things can get a bit squeezy. And so we started to use our faith back then uh, in this way. And I started to believe God for a pair of socks. I thought it's good enough for him, good enough for me. Why don't I make socks my faith project? And made other various projects. And then I aimed a bit higher. And some of the things that I aimed, uh, aimed for at the time was just a little too high. And it hadn't come to pass. But that's okay. Because my faith is still out there. I'm not saying it's not happening or it didn't work. My faith is still out there. And so don't, don't pull your faith in. And don't, don't, uh, don't say it's not working. We just uh, find out where you're at with your faith. And begin to stretch on and press on from there. The Bible speaks about weak faith. It he talked about Abraham in Romans chapter uh, 14. It says, not being weak in faith. Not being weak in faith. So there's evidently weak faith. So it goes from no faith to dead faith to little faith to weak faith. And there's even wavering faith. Book of James speaks about wavering faith. That sometimes it's there and then it wavers a little bit. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And that's why, you know, faith will put stability into our lives. And if we do not put up with wavering faith, we will become absolute uh, a rock of faith and absolutely stable. Bible speaks about shipwrecked faith. Um, uh, Paul the Apostle in Timothy spoke to young Timothy about a couple of guys called uh, Alexander and Hymenius, and he says they've run their, their, their faith shipwreck. Uh, uh, it's like a, if, if faith were a, were a ship, they run it on rocks, and it, now it's not working anymore, and now they're taking in water. Shipwrecked faith. Um, and yet it speaks about increased faith. And we've looked at that before, increased faith. And that's what I, I want our faith to do. It's forever increasing for us individually and collectively as a local church. We want our, I want our faith to be increasing all the time so we can push out the borders and, and increase the sphere of our influence and bring the word out and go further and deeper to where we've gone before. And nowadays with that whole online capability and we've got some good people working in this whole area that we can take these messages worldwide. Uh, because a message, once it's preached, it's good for 10 people, it's good for 100, 1,000, and it's good for a million people. Um, it's because if it blesses one group, it'll bless another group. And, and there is a mandate on our church, and there is a mandate on myself as the pastor to teach faith to people so it lifts them out of wherever they are right now. You know, some people's lives are quite good and quite okay uh, before they come to Jesus, but the reality is even a good life will one day end and if they don't have Jesus in their life, it'll still end up in hell. And there's just no nice way to put this, my friend. We've got to absolutely state what the word says and not become politically correct. Um, but most people's lives uh, need a lot of help 
when they get saved. I certainly did. When I look back today, like it's, uh, it's if you knew me back then, and I was mentioning before when I was in when I was in Guernsey, I just saw that little clip then reminded me of that small island there on the, on the Channel Islands between. England and, and France and everything, uh, my, my life needed a little help. Uh, if you saw me back then and you saw me today, I'm, I'm unrecognizable now. Um, and, and that's what faith will do. It will shift us into a better place. It'll shift us into a better marriage. It'll shift us into a more stable and functioning family. When this function gets pushed out and function comes in, functioning according to God's design and to God's purposes. Uh, I know I'm bouncing around a bit here, guys, but friends, I cannot overstate and overstress that, that sometimes people just try to get by. And we do, should not try to get by. We need to learn faith and go all out, all in, 100%. So the Bible speaks about great faith, uh, strong in faith. Speaks about Abraham that he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Then it speaks about great faith. When Jesus one day was approached by a Roman centurion, which is a, who is a soldier that is in charge of a hundred soldiers. So sort of quite a guy, if you like. And this man came and he says, Master, he says, I've got a servant at home that is nearly dying. He's, he's lying and he's nearly, he's dying. And he says, would you, would you heal him? And, and Jesus, being who he was, yeah, I'll come and I'll come to your house. And the man said, no, no, Master. He says, you don't need to come under my roof. You see, there was some cultural things that went on and some religious things that went on that Jews were actually not supposed to go into the houses of non-Jewish people because, you know, as far as tradition and religion was concerned, not the Word of God, but as far as religion was concerned, they would have, they would have been unclean because of the contact there. And this is what the religious devil does. They're just We talked about it a few weeks ago. Religious devils just come up with all sorts of crazy ideas. Jesus says, I'll come and heal him. And he says, Master, please, you don't need to come. He says, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. This man knew that, yes, Jesus went around, he laid hands on people, and they got healed. But this man also knew that faith knows no distance, that, uh, that the healing power can travel over distance. And uh, it's wonderful if we are close up and we can anoint somebody with oil and we can, we can uh, uh, you know, lay hands on them. But in this instance here, uh, the, the man said, no, 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 Jesus, you don't need to come. He says, speak the word only. He says, because I've got servants too. He says, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another one, come, and he comes. And uh, this man had an understanding that faith is like a servant. And faith can go, it can be commanded to go, and faith can come. You think about this. And Jesus says, wow, he says, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, I've not found such great faith. No, not in Israel. Here's this foreigner. He's outside the covenant uh, uh, that God has with Israel as a nation. This man is a foreigner. He's part of, an, of the occupying force. Yet he's a man that operate, operated by faith. And there was one other time when there was a woman from Canaan. She's a Canaanite. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Canaanite, a Phoenician woman, uh, specifically uh, giving reference to her ethnicity. And she came one day, and he says, Master, he says, my little girl is severely demon-possessed. Would you please help her? And this instance here, the, the disciples around Jesus wanted to shoo her away. He said, Lord, tell you to go away. Uh, and... and uh, and anyway, he said, look, uh, Jesus says to her, look, I've been sent uh, first and foremost to the house of Israel. And she says, yes, true, Lord. He says, but even, even when the master sets the table, crumbs fall off the, da off, off the table. And, uh, you know, Jesus actually said to her, look, he says, uh, he says uh, I I've been sent to the house of Israel. I have not been sent to minister to dogs. And that's kind of a bit of a strong word because culturally, uh, non-Jewish people were sometimes made, you know, referred to as, as dogs. They were just outside the covenant, and she says, true, Lord, but, she says, even crumbs fall from the master's table for the dogs to eat. And in this instance here, Jesus saw her persistence. It is, woman, great is your faith. Go, he says, for your daughter is healed. So in her, not taking no for an answer. And when we walk by, by faith, we don't take no for an answer. 
We don't let no religious devil talk us out of it. We don't let no well-meaning Christian talk us out of it. Because sometimes when you set your sight and you stretch beyond and, and everything else, not everybody gets excited over that. Uh, sometimes you'd be surprised what, what we are wrestling with sometimes. We are wrestling with people's jealousies. We are wrestling with that whole tall poppy syndrome and somebody rises up and God begins to prosper them, then you get accused of doing something wrong, and, and in, in order to get, as I say, all sorts of things and mindsets that we're wrestling with. But let us not be stopped, my friend. We're moving beyond where we've been in the past. So in this instance, uh, Jesus said, oh, strong faith, uh, uh, great is your faith. And then, of course, there's exceedingly growing faith. Uh, we looked at that early in the lives of the Thessalonians. And there's also a term called full of faith. You will remember, for those of you that have read the book of Acts, where in Acts chapter 6, they chose uh, seven deacons to minister uh, in a particular capacity. And the Bible says that they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. You see, everybody that serves in the house should really be a person full of faith. All right? And this man was full of faith. So if it's possible to be full of faith, it's also possible to be full of unbelief. And it's, it's possible to be filled with a mixture of half and half, uh, like, you know, as I said, that back and forth sort of a deal. So I'm saying, let's get all the doubt and all the unbelief out, if there is any, and it can only be done by faith. If we don't operate by faith, this thing will close in on us um, and push us into the natural where we're absolutely limited by just sheer strength and physical power. But certain things, friend, cannot be dealt with physically. They must be dealt with in the realm of the Spirit. So as we begin to study the Word of God on the subject of faith, we'll be reminded of and we will learn how to have exceedingly growing faith exceedingly growing faith. And when our faith grows, our world will be too small. Let me tell you, our world will be too small. There's an extending of the borders. And I speak prophetically to some of you. Your world is too small. I remember many years ago, I stepped into an auditorium uh, uh, of a local church um, outside of our city. And, back, um, and the first time I stepped in, I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is amazing. The second time I stepped into it, it felt small. It felt almost claustrophobic. And I suddenly realized, I was here before, and I thought this was huge. And now I'm here, and now I think it's small. My faith has grown, and God wants me to push out the borders. Friends, this place, it's way too small for us. I've been talking to some of our leaders for some months now. I said, this place is way too small for us. <laughs> We're getting ready to extend our faith. We're aiming for a new auditorium. And, 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 and we can't settle here. And we've never been settlers. We've always been pioneers. We have a pioneering faith about us. That is our beginning. That's how we started. And that spirit is still on us today. We are pioneers. We're not settlers. You know, they say when people in, the, in America, you know, when they went to the West, they talked about the Wild West. You know, it's the pioneers that ran out there and fought the enemies. Probably not so politically correct nowadays when you talk about these things, but the movies are still around today. And... Uh, and the, and, the, and the people sort of just, you know, built roads and, you know, it was the pioneers that cut the roads and went out. Then after them, the settlers came in and they settled down and they carved out their little plot of land. And this is our lot in life. But, but pioneers will never accept a little plot of land. Pioneers will never accept a, a certain station in life. Let's not camp around the station in life that we're in today, my friend. Don't settle with where you're at today. Let's go beyond. Let's make it a faith project to go beyond for no other reason than to go beyond. Do not let your boundaries define who you are. Do not let your current station in life determine who you are. There's more in you that God wants to bring out. There's a greater potential. And that means for some of you, you absolutely need to deal to, 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 to fears and to, to restrictions in your life where you've been told you can't do it and you've believed that you need to get rid of that thought. 
And for some of you, you need to step out besides and beyond yourself. Some of you will go, will end up with a business of your own. You're done with working for somebody else. You will step beyond where you are right now. Some of you will absolutely step into, into a greater ministry role in terms of serving God to a greater capacity. You are done with just inactivity. You are done with just a mundane kind of a meaninglessness. Uh, you, 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 you need a purpose and God will give you purpose. If there's anything that I can do as your pastor to encourage you into a ministry, and as I said, we all have a ministry in the house and we all got a ministry out of the house. But if I can encourage you into, into stepping further and deeper into the purposes of God, I want to I wanna do so this morning. Uh, I got my pastor's prod in my hand today. Uh, it's called the pastor's prod. You know that little prod that sometimes they use to sort of prod? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm just prodding you a little bit here this morning. I'm prodding you by faith because you know that I love you. You know that I want God's best for you. But the reality is you haven't stepped into everything that God has for you. Many of you, you haven't got enough money. You just have got nowhere near enough money. And just think beyond and outside of yourself. Don't say, oh, my bills are paid. Step beyond that and help to pay somebody else's bill. And, and, uh, and when you get into a life of liberty, gosh, you see, you see bondages all around you. Uh, while, we, while you're in bondage yourself, you can't see it. But when you step into a life of liberty, it says, why, why are people putting up with this nonsense? Bondages, restrictions, uh, uh, things that are going on. And, and, and it's let's just stretch. Let's just stretch beyond that. Point number five, and I'm moving very quickly now. What do we need our faith for? Well, <laughs> I think the question has been uh, answered to a certain extent by now, but let me uh, hit a few highlights and a few points along the way. I did say we were going to start from ground zero. Um, what is our faith for? Well, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Everybody say, through faith. Amen. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. And the whole point here is, friends, that we didn't get saved by works. We didn't get saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. We got saved by faith and by faith alone. All right? So letter A, we are saved through faith. Well, it says by grace, through faith. And here's how it works. God has made salvation available through, in his grace and he's given us faith to receive it. That it's only by faith and by faith only. Romans 1.17, the good news shows how God makes people right with himself. The good news meaning the gospel. That it begins and ends with faith. Here it is. It begins and ends with faith. As the scripture says, those who are right with God shall live by faith. So let it be, it means that we are made right with God by faith. And then that means, let us see, that we begin to live by faith. Faith becomes our modus operandi, if I can use that expression. That everything, is about, us, everything about us is done by faith. That we, we, everything we look at, we look at it by faith. Everything we do, we do by faith. And yes, we still go to work, and yes, we still pay our bills, and yes, we still all of these things, but it's now got a faith aspect to it. Every aspect of our life. One translation says, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Abraham started to live by faith way back. The nation of Israel was toggling in and out when the 12 spies were sent into the wilderness to check out the land. 12 spies went in and they all came back. 10 were in doubt and unbelief, 2 were in faith. The ones in doubt and unbelief, they died in the wilderness. And Joshua, the Bible says, and Caleb, who had a different spirit in them, they stepped on into the promised land. It's by faith. Second Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. For we walk by faith, not by sight. The Amplified Translation amplifies on that a bit more. Here it is. For we walk by faith, we regulate our lives, 
and conduct ourselves by our conviction or belief, respecting God's relationship to God and divine things. You know that your health that God wants you to have, it's a divine thing. Your prosperity, God considers it a divine thing. It's a holy thing to God that you're able to pay your bills and go beyond. So as I say, let's just look away from ourselves and what we might have been prepared to put up with in the past. Say, it's a holy thing for me to step into the 100% that Jesus has paid for on the cross. It says, uh, divine things with trust and holy fervor. Thus we walk not by sight or by appearance. So letter D, we walk by faith, no longer by sight, no longer by appearances, no longer by the feelings. Faith has become our rule of conduct in this life. And as I say, if you haven't heard this kind of teaching before, and it's all a bit of a puzzle to you, stay with it. I encourage you, friends, stay with it over the next few weeks. By the time we get to the end of it, you'll see the house that we're building. You'll see the structure. You will see the principles and the concepts, and you will absolutely be able to step into a new place in your life. There are two realities that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Two realities. The first one is the natural realities of circumstances, symptoms, and situations. Everything that appears to the physical eye and to the touch and everything that, you know, that goes on around us in the natural. That's the first reality. The second one is all the spiritual realities that are spoken of and promised to us in God's Word. And all the promises are there that God has made to us not to tease us, but to give us faith so that we can reach out and receive them and pull them into our lives. Yes. As part of our faith walk, we learn to ignore the natural realities and focus on the spiritual realities of God's Word. Sometimes people get things slightly skewed and they say, oh, it's just all mind over matter, isn't it? No, it's not mind over matter. It's spirit over natural. Yeah. Yes, we see the natural. And yes, we deal with the natural. And yes, we, we, we go about our business as we, we did before, but we're now putting faith over this whole thing. And we no longer accept restrictions. We no longer accept uh, bondages. We no longer accept the natural, the, uh, uh, accept st status quo as it were. We focus on the spiritual realities. And we know that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. Once he's said it, he will do it. Once he's spoken, he will make good his word to those who choose to walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 1 um, verse 24. We're still talking about what faith is for. It says, not that we have dominion over your faith, but are fellow workers for you, for by faith you stand. So we... We get saved by faith, we walk by faith, we live by faith, and we stand by faith. So by now we realize faith is actually more important than what a lot of people give it credit, as it were, because everything is done by faith. So we stand by faith, and in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, for anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. And that brings us to the next sub-point here later. If we can please God only by faith. God is not pleased by our struggles. And God most certainly don't, don't put struggles into our lives. But when somebody says, I've had enough of struggling, I'm going to stop walking by faith. And I'm going to work my way out of this thing by faith. God is pleased with that. And as I said, there's a whole area, friend, uh, where religion has closed in on people and closed down on people and restricted people's lives. Religion is a horrible thing. 
And when we talk about religion, we mean like a whole system there that's been designed uh, 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 to a major extent by the devil. Yes, it has got aspects of truth in it, but religion has managed to explain the power of God away. It has managed to just diminish uh, uh, the place where God wants us to go to and everything. When we talk about Christianity, we're talking about a personal relationship. And the devil always wants to put religion on people. And religious people, boy, they will get upset when you start prospering. They will get upset when you suddenly raise up your head. And then sometimes relatives around you say, what is it about you? You know, you, you, and everything, ignore it. It's all part of the, the devil wants to bring persecution into your life. And you some, sometimes even well-meaning people just ca- kind of shut you down and to put you back down into the place wherever you've been in before. Let's rise up. Let's live big lives. Our world has become too small for us. It's become too small for us individually. It's become too small for us collectively. We're aiming for bigger things. We've got a faith project on the go. And then point number six, I only got two more points, and I'm moving very quickly now. It's what is faith? Well, we will describe what faith is as we go forward. But if I had to just single it out in one point that will, to a certain extent, capture what faith is, I will put it this way. Faith is believing God's word over and above what we see with our natural eyes. Faith is believing God's word. And praise God for calling the Bible, Bible. Because the word Bible means book. But it's not just any book. It's God's book. It's God's written word of God. And let's settle once and for all. Any idea that you had or heard that God's word has been messed with and tampered with and it's not really the real deal, put that aside. Otherwise, you can never have great faith. Because ultimately, it comes down to the written word of God. And believing that past and beyond That's why when Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight, he's talking about natural death. And he's talking about going to heaven. And he says, uh, says when we get to heaven, he says, we, we, we're looking forward to having, having you know, to be, uh, as it were, unclothed in, 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 in this life, with, with our old life, with our body, and to get to heaven to be clothed with our glorified body. In the natural If you looked at it purely in the natural, somebody's life begins and somebody's life ends, and that's the end of it. But the Word of God tells us that, yes, our life did did begin, but it goes on forever and ever. And the Bible describes to us places in eternity, a place called heaven and a place called hell. So we don't tamper with that anymore. It is what it is. All right? And the Bible tells us how to get to the one, and if we neglect that, how, how we will end up in the other. And as I say, the Word of God describes to us our, the whole spirit realm. And you see, the whole point is this, that uh, people say, I believe in angels because I've seen one. And I say, that's wonderful. You know why I believe in angels? I believe in angels because the Word tells me about angels. Whether I see one or not see one has nothing to do with it now. I believe in heaven, not because I've been there, because the Word tells me about heaven. I believe in hell as a real place because the Word tells me about hell. And I believe in a true salvation because the Word tells me about a true salvation. And I believe in only one way to heaven because the Word says there's only one way to heaven and His name is Jesus Christ. So faith is believing God's word over and above what we see in the natural eyes. The word of God becomes final authority in our lives. Everything else, we call it by the lying vanity. It's just a circumstance. It's just a situation. It might be there right now, but it will be gone tomorrow. We can change it, and we can change it by faith. Mark 15, verse 31. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking amongst themselves with the scribe, they said, he saved others but he cannot save himself. This is now Jesus hanging on the cross. They're at the foot of the cross mocking. They said, let the Christ, uh, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. You see, faithless people want to see before they're prepared to believe. 
But people with faith, they believe. They are prepared to believe before they see. And because they believe, they will see. It's a whole back to front kingdom, my friend. We know the saying, seeing is believing, but it's not like that in the word. Believing and then seeing is what the word describes to us. That's kind of a very, very basic description of what faith is and what faith looks like. So faithless people demand to see before they're prepared to believe, and people of faith are prepared to believe before they see. John 20, verse 27, Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand, and put out your hand and place it in my side, and do not be faithless, but believing. And many of you know the story. Jesus was crucified. He died. Three days later, he rose again, and he appeared to a group of his disciples, not all of them, but to some of them. And Thomas wasn't there. And the next time Jesus talks to them and everything and then disappears again. The next time Thomas comes in to say, guess what, Thomas? We've seen the Lord. And Thomas says, "Uh uh-uh. He says, I don't believe it. Because he saw him hanging on the cross as well. He says, unless I'm able to put my finger into his print where they hung him to the cross, I'm able to put my hand into his side, which describes the gouge. That they, when they took to him with that spear and the, and the nails that they wrecked through his, through his hands, unless I'm able to do this, see and touch and do this, I will not believe. And here again is a faithless man. Jesus appears to them again. He goes straight over to Thomas. And here is the good thing. He didn't scold him. He didn't belittle him. He says, Thomas, why don't you put your finger here? as you've requested, and, you know, God wants to help us. And he says, put your hand in here. And he says, and do not be faithless. He says, but believe. And uh, there is this whole thing where the Jews were forever asking, we want a sign, we want a wonder. Show us signs and wonders, and we believe. They saw all the signs, they saw all the wonders, they still did not believe. First Peter chapter 1 You who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last days. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And here it is. This is what what we're aiming for. Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith. You see, faith has an outcome. He says, in this instance, the outcome of their faith, he says, is the salvation of your souls. And if we can translate that understanding here of us believing in Jesus, though we haven't seen him, and only believing what the Word says, and because we have experienced him, and loving Jesus, though we don't see him now, we can translate that into every area of our lives and take the Word of God and believe it for what it says. We are living a life of faith. We're no longer demanding to see before we're prepared to believe. We're now prepared to believe without seeing, and by doing so, we will see. Last point, very quickly. How do we get faith? All of that to say, how do we get faith? Well, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 describes how we get faith. It says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing the teaching and the preaching of the written Word of God. That's why we got a lot of Scripture in our messages. That's why we don't preach trendy things. That's why we don't just bounce around and have a little poem here, a little tap dance here and everything to entertain people. We preach the Word because only the Word ministers faith into people's lives. God's Word heard. God's Word received. And God's word understood will cause faith to rise in our hearts. So my friend, let me encourage you. Make a fresh focus on upping your intake of God's word. 
Whatever it is right now, if you are already kind of doing everything you know that you're able to do, I encourage you to keep it up. But if somehow your word intake is a bit low, up it again, because in order for faith to be there and for faith to grow, that is one of the conditions. And in the end, it only comes down to ourselves. Don't miss any church services. We are going somewhere in our series of messages. I really encourage you with that.